for that. Let's turn to the Word of God. 1 Kings chapter 19. 1 Kings chapter 19. We're reading from verse 7 uh, through to the end of verse 19. Again, familiar words, but let's read them together. 1 Kings 19 verse 7. And the angel of the Lord came again the second time and touched him and said, Arise and eat, because the journey is too great for thee. And he arose and did eat and drink, and went in the strength of that meat forty days and forty nights unto Horeb, the mount of God. And he came thither unto a cave and lodged there. And behold, the word of the Lord came to him, and he said unto him, What doest thou here, Elijah? And he said, I have been very jealous for the Lord God of hosts, for the children of Israel have forsaken thy covenant, thrown down thine altars, and slain thy prophets with the sword. And I, even I only, am left, and they seek my life to take it away. And he said, Go forth and stand upon the mount before the Lord. And behold, the Lord passed by, and a great and strong wind rent the mountains, and break in pieces the rocks before the Lord. But the Lord was not in the wind, and after the wind an earthquake, but the Lord was not in the earthquake, and after the earthquake a fire, but the Lord was not in the fire, and after the fire a still small voice. And it was so when Elijah heard it that he wrapped his face in his mantle and went out and stood in the entering in of the cave. And behold, there came a voice unto him and said, What doest thou here, Elijah? And he said, I have been very jealous for the Lord God of hosts, because the children of Israel have forsaken thy covenant, thrown down thine altars, and slain thy prophets with the sword, and I, even I, only am left, and they seek my life to take it away. And the Lord said unto him, Go, return on thy way to the wilderness of Damascus, and when thou comest, anoint Haziel to be king over Syria. And Jehu, the son of Nimshi, shall thou anoint to be king over Israel. And Elisha, the son of Zaphat, the Abelmethola, shalt thou anoint to be prophet in thy room. And it shall come to pass that him that escapeth the sword of Haziel shall Jehu slay, and him that escapeth from the sword of Jehu shall Elisha slay. Yet I have left me seven thousand in Israel, all the knees which have not bowed unto Baal, and every mouth which hath not kissed him. So he departed thence and found Elisha the son of Shaphat, who was plowing with twelve yoke of auction before him, and he with the twelfth. And Elijah passed by and cast his mantle upon him. And amen. The story is told of a marketing seminar. And the lecturer at this marketing seminar arrived one day and put a big jar on the desk, one gallon jar. And all the young executives were watching. And he got big stones and he put the big stones in the jar right up to the top. And he said to the young executives, is the jar full? And they said, yes, the jar's full. He says, no, it's not. And he got out pebbles and the pebbles were poured in and they fell between the cracks and the stones right up to the top. And he says, is it full now? They said, yes, it's full. He says, no, it's not. He got sand. And they poured the sand and the sand fell between the pebbles, between the rocks, right up to the top. He says, is it full now? And of course, they'd caught on by this time. They said, probably not. He says, you're right. And he got a jug of water and he poured it in and it fell between the sand, between the pebbles, between the rocks, right up to the top. And he said to these young executives, he says, what's the lesson? And one young lad said, I know. No matter how full you think your diary is, if you shake it around, you'll always fit something more in. (laughs) And he says, no, the lesson is this. If you don't put the big boulders in first, you'll not get them in at all. If you don't put the big boulders in first, you'll not get them in at all. Whenever it comes to the things of God, the big stones that we put in first for Christians is our worship and prayer, that is the relationship between man and God. Our Bible study, that's the relationship between God and man. There is fellowship, the the relationship between brother and sister with brother and sister. And there is service, that 
relationship as we reach out to unbelievers. And we have to put those big boulders in first because if you don't, you will fill your life with the spiritual pebbles and gravel and water and sand and all the things that don't really count. And we'll have no room for the big boulders. And I have to say to my shame, it's very easy to fill your life with the pebbles and the sand and the water and somehow feel you have no time for the big boulders that go in first. We are looking at this giant of a man, Elijah. We left him last week suffering from depression and we saw the strategy of satanic attack and then we looked at the strategy of the Savior's response and we saw that the Lord came with that loving touch, that personal touch, that practical touch, that special touch of the Lord that got him up on his feet again and saved him from the onslaught of satanic attack. You will notice that verse 8 introduces us to the first crash diet in the Bible. I'm thinking of using it. It says that he arose and did eat and drink and went in the strength of that meat 40 days and 40 nights unto Horeb, the Mount of God. So one meal every 40 days. I'm going to go on that diet. I'm going to call it the Elijah diet. Eh? And one meal every 40 days unto Horeb, the Mount of God. Ian asked me last week what I was going to preach on this week. And I was going to preach on the last verses that I read whenever Elijah was in the cave in Horeb and he heard the still small voice. I'll get to that, God willing, eventually. After I preach, every time I preach, I do a post-mortem on my way home and I think of the things I said and the things that maybe I should have said. And on my way home, I had a problem. And the problem is found in verse 8. He arose and did eat and drink and went in the strength of that meat 40 days and 40 nights unto Horeb, the Mount of God. And as I drove home to Balamina last Thursday night, my dilemma was this. If Elijah was depressed, if Elijah has just faced satanic attack, why did the Lord ask him to do a 40-day hike to, to Horeb, the Mount of God? You see, if I'm counseling somebody and they are stressed and pressurized, I would be telling them not to go on a 40-day hike. I'd be saying, stay in, stay still, read your Bible, spend time with God, rest in him. I wouldn't be saying start a hike to go 40 days and 40 nights to a mount. And I started on the way home thinking, what was so special about Mount Horeb? Could he not have enjoyed the Lord's presence there under the juniper tree? Was he in such a need of a mini break, a holiday, a change of scenery? Why did God send him on this 40-day hike to Horeb? And that's what I want to speak about tonight primarily. What was so special about Horeb that God said, Elijah, I know that you're under satanic attack. I know you're weak. I know you're depressed. But I'm going to feed you. And I want you to get up. And I want you to walk 40 days and 40 nights to Horeb. I have come to the conclusion. You can disagree with me if you want. I've come to the conclusion that this 40-day walk was vital for Elijah. Because Elijah was in fact returning to his spiritual roots. He was going back to spiritual basics. And very often when we're under satanic attack, that's exactly what we need to do. We go back down to the foundation again. We go back to spiritual kindergarten. And we remember the simple things of God that are taught in the word of God. And many times in my life, I have had to go back to spiritual basics, spiritual ABCs, the very foundation of my faith. The day I got saved in Ebenezer Gospel Hall, in the Old Park Road, the times when I sat in this fellowship, in my early Christian experience with Hedley Murphy and Jimmy Murphy and all those great men of God that were around us. 
And I had to go back many a time to spiritual basics. What I discovered this week is this. There were three great events happened at Mount Horeb. Three great events. And as I looked at them, I became more and more convinced that God was reminding Elijah of the spiritual ABCs, the spiritual basics that happened at Horeb. And I think as Elijah made that journey, he started to think of the things that happened at Mount Horeb. The first thing that he would have been reminded of was the power of God. The power of God. You see, it was at Horeb that Moses stood at the burning bush. And if you want to read it, you'll find it in Exodus chapter 3 and verse 1. And you'll find that he was looking after the flock of his father-in-law, Jethro. And he was at Horeb when he saw this bush that was on fire and was not consumed. And he turned aside to see the sight and he went over and you know the story the the voice spoke to him out of the bush take your shoes off Moses or, or take your shoes off Moses, for the ground on which you stand is holy ground take your shoes off show respect Moses you're in the presence of deity and God called Moses back into service my wouldn't Elijah have needed to hear this he, he had been suicidal a few days earlier, uh, 40 days earlier. He, 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 he was struggling in his faith. He was struggling as God's preacher, as God's prophet. And he's reminded as he comes to Horeb that this is where Moses, the, 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 the murderer, the man who made spiritual shipwreck, he got called back into service. Do you remember how Moses said, who will I say sent me? And he says, tell them the I am sent you. I am. I am all that any occasion needs. Moses met Yahweh, the almighty sovereign God, who's omnipotent over it all. Elijah needed to hear this. He needed to be reminded that the God that he served was bigger than all the problems and bigger than all the difficulties. He needed to be reminded of the I am. John's Gospel, of course, has the, the seven I am's that I'm sure you've heard preached on many, many times. John 6, I am the, the bread of life. John 10, I am the light of the world. John 14, I am the way, the truth, and the life. I am the door. I, I am the good shepherd. I am the resurrection and the life. I am the true vine. All those great truths, the bread of life for the hungry, the light of the world for those in darkness, the, the, the way, the truth, and the life for those who are lost in their sin, the I am. And Elijah went 40 days to Horeb to be reminded of the God of power, the great I am. I am all that's needed. And he remembered Moses, the failure, the murderer, and how Jehovah, the great I am, had not finished with him. And maybe for you and me tonight in Ballysun, we need to travel in mind to Mount Horeb and remind ourselves at the burning bush of the one who's the great I am. He's bigger than the problems in your family. He's bigger than the problems in my family. He's, he's bigger than the health issues. And, the, and, and waiting for doctor's reports and tests. And he's bigger than those moments when the doctor holds your hand and gives you bad news. He's bigger than it all. The God that we serve is the great I am. And God is not looking, I tell you, dear saint of God, God is not looking for those who preach the most. He's not looking for those who talk the most. God is looking for those who love him the most. Do you know how God measures your love? You see, I, I meet Christians who think that God measures our love by the number of times we attend the meetings. And because you attend all the time, then you must love him. 
Well, of course we shouldn't miss the meeting. Don't forsake the assembling of yourselves together. But that's not how God measures our love. Some people think he measures our love by how much of the Bible we've been able to memorize and how much we're able to know of the Bible from Genesis to Revelation. And the more we know, then God's very impressed. And he says, oh, you must love me. That's not how God measures love. God measures love by by doing this. He measures how much you sacrifice for him. And he says, that's the amount that you love me. Do you remember David? David in in, uh, 2 Samuel 24, he, he numbered the people against the command of God and there was a plague arrived in the nation of Israel. And he realized he had done wrong. And so he went to Arua, the Jebusite. And he said to Arua, I want to buy the threshing floor. Because I have sinned, I want to make a sacrifice unto the Lord. I want to to sacrifice and I'm to show that I'm sorry. And Arua said, David, you're the king. You're the king. You can have the threshing floor for nothing. Not only that, I'll build you the altar and I'll give you all the animals you need to make your sacrifice. I'll give it to you free. Now, as a Balamina man, I would have said, well, the Lord's in this. <laughs> it's an answer to prayer, if ever there was an answer to prayer. But you know what David said? He says, shall I offer unto the Lord my God of that which cost me nothing? David says, if it doesn't cost me anything, it doesn't mean anything. God would be measuring how much he was prepared to sacrifice. It's not just financial, by the way. The cost of our time, spending time on our knees. The cost of our commitment, ringing people who are in need. And God measures how much we sacrifice for him. Because if it costs us nothing, it means nothing. We have a, a mighty resource, the great I am. And God can take the failure like Moses and Elijah and Lawrence Kennedy and and because of who he is, he can make them useful and effective in his service. Do you remember the early church, Acts 1 and 8? But ye shall receive power after that the Holy Ghost has come upon you. We have a powerful God. Dear friend, don't cut God down to a size that suits you. Don't cut him down to a side that's convenient and you're comfortable with. The God that we serve is almighty. There is nothing that he can't do. Nothing. Not a thing. He can fulfill his purposes and will fulfill it. So often people are left with an insipid, weak deity. Because they've got cut God down to a size that they're comfortable with. So, Elijah, on his way to Horeb, he would be reminded, this is where Moses met the great I am, the power of God. Something else happened at Horeb. He would be reminded not only of the power of God, but the Spirit of God. You see, it was at Horeb where the people came to Moses thirsty. And Moses went to the Lord in Exodus 17, I think it's verse 6. And God said, smite the rock. And whenever Moses took the staff and smote the rock, the water came out to satisfy a thirsty nation. That happened at Horeb. And here Elijah is making his way to Horeb 40 days, and he thinks about Moses at the burning bush, the power of God, the great I am. And he's reminded of Moses at Horeb and the people thirsty. And he smites the rock and the water springs forth to satisfy the thirst of a needy people. You know, it is a tragedy when you see Christians enduring their faith. Because I find that those who endure their faith want everybody else to endure it too. (laughs) And they seem to be miserable in their faith and they want everybody else to be miserable.
They seem to have a lot of rules and negativity. I remember growing up and no, you don't, you're not allowed to do that. You're not allowed to do that. You're not, you're not allowed to go there. You're not allowed to be with him. You're not allowed to do that. You're not. And I thought in my mind that there was somebody somewhere with a big rule book. And whenever I asked my mum and dad if I go somewhere, they said, hold on. And they would have rang them up and said, hold on, hold on to the check. No, oh, no, no, they can't do that. <laughs> and then the next time I go, can I go on to the pictures? Or, oh, hold on. Oh, no, no. No, no. And, and I was a Christian a long time. Whenever I realized there's no rule book. There's no rule book. Our faith is not a list of do and don'ts. Our faith is not a list of rules and regulations. Our faith is not a denomination. Our faith is a person. It's Christ in you, the hope of glory. And Helen Lemmel writing back in 1922, I think it was, she got it right when she wrote the wee chorus, Turn your eyes upon Jesus. Look full in his wonderful face. And the things of earth will grow strangely dim in the light of his glory and grace. There's no rule book. The fact is when we get enraptured and taken up with Jesus Christ, as we get taken up with all he's done for us at the cross, when he shed his blood, those other things lose their attractiveness. And they hold no appeal. We don't need a rule book because we're so caught up with the one who loved us and died for us. Our faith is a living person Christ in you, the hope of glory. Paul writing to the Colossians, Colossians 1.27, I think. Christ in you, the hope of glory. Dear saint of God, we need to get to Horeb like Elijah. To once again capture God's power, the great I am. He is bigger than your problems and bigger than our crisis. I have a crisis at the moment. Started March time. It's out of my league. But it has driven me and my wife to our knees. And our family are looking on to see how God's going to resolve it. I haven't a clue at the moment how it's going to be resolved. But I know that he's bigger than the problem. He's the great I am. And I'm willing to trust him. Because whenever he meets the need, it's going to be a great testimony, isn't it? Not only that, but we get to Horeb to remind ourselves of the filling, the satisfaction of the Holy Spirit, the smitten rock. Before Pentecost, the disciples were like rabbits. After Pentecost, the disciples were like rock violers. <laughs> the Holy Spirit made them a fighting force for God. The Holy Spirit is not academic. He is dynamic. And the fruit of the Spirit in Galatians 5 is not excitement or orthodoxy. It is Christ-likeness. The Holy Spirit in us shapes us and molds us and purifies us so that day by day we become more like Jesus Christ. I know what you're thinking. He's still a lot of work to do in me. And I say amen to that but he's still working. Yeah. Getting to Horeb. Elijah's making this journey. He'd be reminded of the power of God, the burning bush. M Moses meant the great I am. He he he's walking and he's reminded of the spirit of God. Whenever Moses split the rock and there was water to refresh, refresh a thirsty, parched heart. Something else happened at Horeb. Boy, this, good, this did me good. I hope it does you good, because it did me good this week. Thinking of these things. I discovered that not only would he have learnt about the power of God and the Spirit of God, but he would have been reminded of the faithfulness of God. Why? Well, the biggest failure in Israel's history took place at Horeb. 
You'll read about it in Exodus 32 and Exodus 33, particularly uh, Exodus 33 and verse 6, because it was at Horeb that Aaron gave the people the golden calf to worship. Moses had gone up the mount to commune with God. And the people came to Aaron and says, Moses is gone. We want a God like the, the nations around us. We want to be the same as them. They have gods of gold and silver and brass. Why can we not do it? This is the modern way to do it, Aaron. Why can we not do it? It's okay for them. Works for them. And so Aaron said, bring all the gold that you got from your masters in Egypt. Hmm? And they melted it down and they made a golden calf. And you remember Moses coming down from the mountain and he smashed the tablets containing the law of God. Disaster. Arguably the greatest mistake that, that Israel ever made. But God didn't wipe them out. God didn't wash his hands of them. But rather after repentance God led them on and led them through to the promised land. He reminded himself of the faithfulness of God faithfulness of God I thank God for those special moments when I journey back to Horeb back to spiritual basics spiritual ABCs <laughs> to remember that the God that I serve is all powerful the power of God to remind myself that it's not rules and regulations but the Holy Spirit within the heart God taking up residence in his children. What a privilege. And the faithfulness of God, because when I make a mistake, he can lift me up and take me on to the end of the journey. I think Elijah had to make that journey, do you? To learn about the power of God and the spirit of God and the faithfulness of God. Was it over? Is that the end? Elijah probably thought it was. I think he thought he would end his days as a hermit on Horeb. And he'd just be away up there communing with God. But the faithfulness of God had not finished with Elijah. Verse 9, he comes. What doest thou here, Elijah? I wonder if you where God wants you to be, be. My mother used to quote to me, only one life will soon be passed. Only what's done for Christ will last. Huh? In verse 10 to 12, you have this powerful situation where the wind comes that cuts the stones and then the earthquake and then the fire. And Elijah was reminded that even though it's big and impressive and noisy, but God wasn't in it. God wasn't in it. Oh, I will love the noisy, spectacular things nowadays. We have churches now putting in mood lighting and worship groups and all the things that they have and trying to catch the moment. But God is not in the wind and the earthquake and the fire, he comes in the still, small voice. Do you hear it? I wonder what he's saying to you tonight. He's maybe saying, I love you. I died for you. Worship me with all of your heart. Put me on the throne of your heart. Notice verse 13. Whenever he hears the still small voice, it was so, verse 13, when Elijah heard it, the still small voice, that he wrapped his face in his mantle and went out of the cave. What was that about? He didn't leave the cave whenever the earthquake and the wind and the fire. But whenever he heard the voice of God, the still small voice, he wrapped his cloak about his head and he lay. I think he didn't want to hear the still small voice. I don't want to hear this, Lord. I'm happy to be a hermit on Horeb. I don't want to hear what you want me to do now. I, I, don't, I, I, 
I don't want to listen. Many years ago, there was a, a Nissan um, car advert, and this man had just bought a new Nissan, and the advert was telling about all the deals he could have got, and he got a bucket, and he put it over his head, and he says, I don't want to hear this. I don't want to hear this. I've missed a bargain. And that's what Elijah's doing. I don't want to hear this. But praise God, you cannot block out the still small voice. He whispers, he calls into the heart. And in his faithfulness, Elijah left Horeb to go back into ministry and service again. Notice, this was meant to be my message, Ian. Here we come to it now. <laughs> he had a new service, verse 15. Go return in the, in the way to the wilderness of Damascus, and when the comest anoint Haziel to be king over Syria, and Jehu to be king over Israel. There was a new service for him. Even though he had been depressed, even though he had been suicidal, even though he had this hike 40 days to Horeb, but he learnt of the power of God and the spirit of God and the faithfulness of God. And, and God said to him, I want you involved in a new service. I want you to anoint Haziel, and I want you to anoint Jehu. A new service. Maybe God has a new service for you. Not only a new service, notice there's a new servant. Remember he had left his servant at Beersheba. He wanted to be alone. He couldn't cope with, the, with anybody around him when he was depressed. Remember that? And here, verse 16, he is a new servant. It says, And Elisha, the son of Zaphat, shalt thou anoint to be prophet in thy room. All of a sudden he had a new confidant, a new friend, a new support, a new help, a new prayer warrior. Elisha was going to get alongside him. So there was a new service, there was a new servant. Notice verse 18, there was a new support. There are 7,000 who have not bowed the knee to Baal, and every mouth who's, who hath not kissed, um, has not kissed him. 7,000 who hadn't bowed the knee. A new service, a new servant, a new support. And so a suicidal servant returns to spiritual service and that's the faithfulness of God, isn't it? And I have lost track of the number of times whenever I have felt at rock bottom. And I've said to my wife, I'm not preaching again. I'm finished. And the Lord brings me back to Horeb. And he renews the Spirit. Why? Because of the power of God, the Spirit of God, the faithfulness of God. And he gives a new task, a new service, a new servant, a new support. Dear saint of God, the lesson is this. There's light at the end of the tunnel. Huh? There's light at the end of the tunnel. Why? Because one day faith will give way to sight. And the Lamb shall be all the glory in Emmanuel's land. There's a land that is fairer than day. And by faith we can see it afar. Eh? Today we face the Ahabs and the Jezebels. Today we can see revival and the power of God. We can see restoration after Satan has attacked us. Why? Because Elijah's God is still our God today. We saw him in the palace. As the Lord God of Israel liveth before whom I stand, there shall be no rain. Remember? We saw him at the brook. We saw him at Zarephath. We saw him on Mount Carmel. We saw him last week in the deepest of valleys. And here we find them at the cave at Horeb and even back into service again because our God is Elijah's God. Let's pray together. Father, we do thank you for your word written so long ago and yet so relevant to us in our daily walk. Father, the folk that will hear tonight and will hear the CDs are unknown to me, but known to thee. Father, bring us to Horeb, even tonight. 
even as we come to pray, that we might be reminded of the power of God and the Spirit of God and the faithfulness of God. Because Elijah's God is our God. Not only for time, but for all eternity. We thank you for the Savior. We thank you for the cross. We thank you for the blood that was shed. And Father, we pray that you will renew us afresh, even as we glean from your word. In the Savior's name we pray. Amen.